not order in number order in number if in place of mingling with the idea that we have of them what properly speaking pertains to the conception of substance we merely consider that the duration of each thing is a mode under which we shall consider this thing in so far as it continues to exist 11 we have certainly to make room in our philosophy for the two contrasted notions one that every actual entity endures and the other that every morning is a new fact with its measure of change these various aspects can be summed up in the statement that experience involves a becoming that becoming means that something be 10 treatise bk i part 2 Sect. 3. 11 Principles. Part 1, 21, and 55. Locke and Hume. 137 comes, and that what becomes involves repetition transformed into novel immediacy. This statement directly traverses one main presupposition which Descartes and Hume agree in stating explicitly. This presupposition is that of the individual independence of successive temporal occasions. For 208 example, Descartes, in the passage cited above, writes, the nature of time is such t that its parts do not depend one upon the other. Also Hume's impressions are self-contained, and he can find no temporal relationship other than mere serial order. This statement about Hume requires qualifying so far as concerns the connection between impressions and ideas. There is a relation of derivation of ideas from impressions which he is always citing and never discussing. So far as it is to be taken seriously first, Nepto refers it to a correlate impression. It constitutes an exception to the individual independence of successive perceptions. This presupposition of individual independence is what I have elsewhere 12 called the fallacy of simple location. The notion of simple location is inconsistent with any admission of repetition. Hume's difficulties arise from the fact that he starts with simple locations and ends with repetition. In the organic philosophy the notion of repetition is fundamental. The doctrine of objectification is an endeavor to express how what is settled in actuality is repeated under limitation, so as to be given for immediacy. Later, in discussing time, this doctrine will be termed the doctrine of objective immortality. Section IV. The doctrine of the individual independence of real facts is derived from the notion that the subject predicate form of statement conveys a truth which is metaphysically ultimate.
Descartes, in the passage cited above, writes, the nature of time is but t that is, parts do not depend one upon the other. Also means impressions are self-contained, and he can find no temporal relationship other than mere serial order. This statement about Hume requires qualifying so far as concerns the connection between impressions and ideas. There is a relation of derivation of ideas from impressions which he is always citing and never discussing. So far as it is to be taken seriously for he never refers it to a correlate impression, it constitutes an exception to the individual independence of successive perception. This presupposition of individual independence is what I have elsewhere twelve called the fallacy of simple location. The notion of simple location is inconsistent with any admission of repetition. Hume's difficulties arise from the fact that he starts with simple locations and ends with repetition. In the organic philosophy the notion of repetition is fundamental. The doctrine of objectification is an endeavor to express how what is settled in actuality is repeated under limitation so as to be given for immediacy. Later, in discussing time, this doctrine will be termed the doctrine of objective immortality. Section ID The doctrine of the individual independence of real facts is derived from the notion that the subject predicate form of statement conveys a truth which is metaphysically ultimate. According to this view, an individual substance with its predicates constitutes the ultimate type of actuality. If there be one individual, the philosophy is monistic, if there be many individuals, the philosophy is pluralistic. With this metastilda sacal presupposition, the relations between individual substances constitute metaphysical nuisances, there is no place for them. Accordingly in defiance of the most obvious deliverance of our intuitive prejudices, every 209J respectable philosophy of the subject predicate type is monistic. The exclusive dominance of the substance quality metaphysics is enormously promoted by the logical bias of the medieval period. It was retarded by the study of Plato and of Aristotle. These authors included the strains of thought which issued in this doctrine, but included them inconsistently mingled with other notions. The substance quality metaphysics triumphed with exclusive dominance in Descartes' doctrine. Unfortunate he did not realize that his notion of the res vera did not end. Till the S till the need of junction of ultimate facts is that entailed by the RS. 12 CF. Science in the modern world. CH. 3. 138. Discussions and applications. Totalian notion of primary substance. Locke led a revolt from this dominance, but inconsistently. For him and also for Hume, in the background and tacitly presupposed in all explanations, there remained the mind with its perceptions. The perceptions, for Hume, are what the mind knows about itself, and tacitly the knowable facts are always treated as qualities of a subject the subject being the mind. His final criticism of the notion of the mind does not alter the plain fact that the whole is a previous. Discussion has included this presupposition. Hume's final criticism only exposes the metaphysical superficiality of his preceding exposition. In the philosophy of organism a subject predicate proposition is considered as expressing a high abstraction. 
The metaphysical superiority of walk over humans is visited in his wide use of the term, idea, which Locke himself introduced in him abandoned. Its use marks the fact that his passive subject predicate bias is Flighty in its warping effect. He first I, I, a asterisk, explains. I have used it i.e. idea to express whatever is meant by phantasm, notion, species, or whatever it is which the mind can be employed about in thinking. The later three, three, six teeth without any explicit notice of the widening of And ideas become 13 or 210 general by separating from them the circumstance of the time, and place, and any other ideas that may determine them to this or that particular existence. Here, for law, the operations of the mind originate from ideas, determine, to particular existence. This is a fundamental principle with law. It is a casual confession to the habits of language with humans, and it is a fundamental principle with the philosophy of organism. In an earlier section 2, 23, one block expresses more vaguely the same doctrine, though in this context he immediately waters it down into an unexplained notion of going constantly together. The mind, being, furnished with a great number of the simple ideas conveyed in by the senses, as they are found in X. Terrier things, takes notice, also, that a certain number of these simple ideas go constantly together. But Locke wavers in his use of this principle of some sort of perception of particular existence, and Hume seeks consistency by abandoning it, while the philosophy of organism seeks to reconstruct Locke by abandoning those parts of his philosophy which are inconsistent with this principle. But the principle itself is to be found plainly stated by Locke. Hume has only impressions of sensation, and of reflection. He writes, the first kind arises in the soul originally, from unknown causes. 14 notes a tacit presupposition of, the soul, as subject, and, impression of sensation, as predicate. Also note the dismissal of any intrinsic relevance to a particular existence, which is an existence in the same sense as a soul, is an existence, whereas Locke illustrates his meaning by referring cf. 3. 13 italics mine, 14 treatise, vk. i. part 1, sec. 2. Locke in hume. 139.3, 7 to a child, corresponding to the soul, in Hume's phrase and to it, nurse, of whom the child has its idea. Hume is certainly inconsistent, because he cannot entirely disregard common sense. But his inconsistencies are violent, and his main argument negates Locke's too. is an example of his glaring inconsistency of phraseology. Note, as to those impressions, which arise from the senses, their ultimate cause is, in my opinion, perfectly inexplicable by human reason, and it will always be impossible to decide with certainty, whether they arise immediately from the object, or are produced by the creative power of the mind, or are derived from the author of R. Being.15 here he inconsistently speaks of the object, whereas he has nothing on hand in his philosophy which J.N.S. Tippies the demonstrative word, thus. In the second reference, the object has emerged into daylight. 
be right. There is no object which implies the existence of any other, if you consider these objects in themselves, and never look beyond the ideas which we form of them. This quotation exhibits an ingenious confusion whereby Hume makes the best of two metaphysical worlds, the world with Locke's principle, and his own world which is without Locke's principle. But Locke's principle amounts to this, that there are many actual existence, and that in some sense one actual existence repeats itself in another actual existence, so that in the analysis of the latter existence a component, determines it, the former existence is discoverable. The philosophy of organism expresses this principle by its doctrines of prehension and of objectification. Locke always supposes that consciousness is consciousness of the ideas in the conscious mind. But he never separates the ideas from the consciousness. The philosophy of organism makes this separation and thereby relegates consciousness to a subordinate metaphysical position and gives to Locke's essay a metaphysical interpretation which was not in Locke's mind. This separation asserts Kant's principle, Gedenkenona inhalt sin huyer, and Schaunenona begrit sin blind. 16 The Kant's principle is here applied in exactly the converse way to Kant's own use of it. Kant is obsessed with the mentality, 212, of intuition, and hence it with its necessary involution in consciousness. His plus suppressed premise is, intuitions are never blind. Section D. In one important respect Hume's philosophical conceptions show a marked superiority over those of Locke. In the essay concerning human understanding, the emphasis is laid upon the morphological structure of human understanding. The logical relationships of various sorts of ideas are examined. Now, whether in physics, biology, or elsewhere, morphology. 15 Treatise, D.K. I. Part 3, Sex. D. D. Also Sex. D. T16 Critique of Pure Reason, Transcendental Logic, Introduction, Sex. I. T. 140. Discussions and Applications. In the sense of the analysis of logical relationships, constitutes the first stage of knowledge. It is the basis of the new, mathematical, method which Descartes introduced. Morphology deals in analytical propositions, as they are termed by Kant. For example, Locke writes, the common names of substances, as well as other general terms, stand for source, which 17 is nothing else but the being made signs of such complex ideas, wherein several particular substances do or might agree, by virtue of which they are capable of being comprehended in one common conception, and be signified by one name. And again, our abstract ideas are thus the measures of species. And again, nor let anyone say, that the power of propagation in animals by the mixture of male and female, and in plants by seeds, keeps the supposed real species distinct and entire. 18 In technical language, Locke had no use for genetic evolution. On the other hand, Hume's train of thought unwittingly emphasizes process. His very skepticism is nothing but the discovery that there is something in the world which cannot be expressed in analytic proposition. Hume discovered that we murder to dissect. He did not say this, but that he belonged to the mid 18th century, and so left the remark to Wordsworth. 
But, in 213 effects, Hume discovered that an actual entity is at once a process, and is atomic, so that in no sense is it the sum of its parts. Hume proclaimed the bankruptcy of morphology. Hume's account of the process discoverable in the soul is as follows. First, impressions of sensation, of unknown origin, then, ideas of such impressions, derived from the impressions, then, impressions of reflection, derived from the antecedent ideas, and then, ideas of impressions of reflection. Somewhere in this process, there is to be found repetition of impressions, and then by habit, by which we may suppose that a particular mode of derivation is meant by habit, a repetition of the correlate ideas, and then expectancy of the repetition of the correlate impressions. This expectancy will be in impression or reflection. It is difficult to understand why Hume exempts habit from the same criticism as that applied to the notion of such. We have no impression of habit just as we have no impression of such. Thus, repetition, habit are all in the same boat. Somewhat inconsistently, Hume never allows impressions of sensation to be derived from the correlate ideas, though, as the difference between them only consists in force and vivacity, the reason for this refusal cannot be found in his philosophy. The truth is that Hume retained an obstinate belief in an external world which his principles forbade him to confess in his philosophical constructions. He reserved that belief for his daily life, and for his historical and sociological writings, and for his dialogues concerning natural religion. The merit of Hume's account is that the process described it within 17 italics mine, 18 3, p. 1, 22, 23. Locke and Hume. 141 Pizza Soul. In the philosophy of organism, the soul, as it appears in Hume, and the mind, as it appears in Locke and Hume, are replaced by the phrases, the actual entity, and the actual occasion, these phrases being synonymous. Two defects found equally in Locke and in Hume, are, first, the confusion between a Lockean idea, and 214 consciousness of such an idea, and, secondly, the assigned relations between ideas of sensation and ideas of reflection. He in Hume's language, this latter point is concerned with the relations between impressions of sensation and impressions of reflection. Hume and Locke, with the overintellectualist bias prevalent among philosophers, assume that emotional feelings are necessarily derivative from sensation. This is conspicuously not the case. The correlation between such feelings and sensations is on the whole a secondary effect. Emotions conspicuously brush aside sensations and fasten upon the particular objects to which in Locke's phrase certain ideas are determined. The confinement of our prehension of other actual entities to the mediation of private sensations is pure myth. The converse doctrine is nearer the truth. The more primitive mode of objectification is via emotional tone, and only in exceptional organisms does objectification, via sensation, supervene with any effectiveness. In their doctrine on this point, Locke and Hume were probably only repeating the mediaeval tradition, and they have passed on the tradition to their successors. Nonetheless, the doctrine
doctrine is founded upon no necessity of thought, and lacks empirical confirmation. If we consider the matter physiologically, the emotional tone depends mainly on the condition of the viscera which are peculiarly ineffective in generating sensation. Thus the whole notion of prehension could be inverted. We prehend other actual entities more primitively by direct mediation of emotional tone, and only secondarily and laboringly by direct mediation of sense. The two modes used as important effects upon our perceptive knowledge. This topic must be reserved team. Parts 3 and IV for further discussion, but it is fundamental in the philosophy of organism. One difficulty in appealing to modern psychology, for the purpose of a preliminary survey of the nature of experience, is that so much of that science is based upon the presupposition of the sensationalist mythology. Thus the Zen 215 tier, more naive surveys of Locke and Hume are philosophically the more useful. Later, in Part 3, A, prehension will be analyzed into prehending subject, object prehended, and subjective form. The philosophy of organism follows Locke in admitting particular, exterior things into the category of object prehended. It also follows Hume in his admission at the end of his appendix to the treatise. Had I said, that two ideas of the same object can only be different by their different feelings, I should have been nearer the truth. What Hume here calls, feeling, is expanded in the philosophy of organism into the doctrine of, subjective form. But there is another ineradicable difference between some prehension, namely, there. 142. Discussions and Applications Diversity of prehending subjects, when the two prehensions are in that respect diverse. The subsequent uses of the term, feeling, are in the sense of the, positive, type of prehension, and not in the sense in which Hume uses it in the above quotation. The approximation of the philosophy of organism to Santayana's doctrine of animal base is effected by this doctrine of objectification or by the mediation of feeling. Santayana would deny that animal base has in it any element of givenness. This denial is presumably made in deference to the sensationalist doctrine that all knowledge of the external world arises by the mediation of private sensation. If we allow the term, animal base, to describe a kind of perception which has been neglected by the philosophic tradition, then practically the whole of Santayana's discussion 19 is in accord with the organic philosophy. The divergence from, and the analogy to, Santayana's doctrine can be understood by quoting two sentences, I, I, propose therefore to use the word existence, to designate not data of intuition but facts or events believed to occur in nature. These facts or events will include, first, intuitions themselves, or instances of Khan 216 Daishiousness, like pains and pleasures and all remembered experiences and mental discourse, and second, physical things and events, having a transcendent relation to the data of intuition which, in belief, may be used as signs for them. Asterisk. It may be remarked in passing that this quotation illustrates Santayana's admirable clarity of thought, a characteristic which he shares with the men of genius of the 17th and 18th centuries. Now the exact point where Santayana differs from the organic philosophy is his implicit assumption that, intuitions themselves, 
cannot be among the data of intuition, that is to say, the data of other intuition. This possibility is what Santayana denies in the organic philosophy of birth. In this respect,